Please welcome our next speaker, Christian Paquin, on integrating post-quantum crypto into real-life applications. Thank you, thank you. So welcome everybody to the uh, last session in the Crypto and Privacy Village. First of all, I'd like to thank the, um, the organizers for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to come here at DEF CON to present uh, my work and along with the work of my esteemed colleagues from the post-quantum crypto group at Microsoft Research. And today I'll be talking about our experiments and in, uh, incubation projects of integrating post-quantum cryptography into real-life applications. So a little outline, it's very straightforward and logical. Start to introduce what is uh, quantum computing, the quantum, and then talk about what we need to do after that in the post-quantum world. And then I'll discuss uh, our integration uh, experiments. So first of all, so just a little poll. I'd like to know who's familiar, not just the word, but uh, how quantum computing works in the room. Oh, fairly good. How about on YouTube? <laughs> See that later in the comments. Okay, so we've all heard about quantum computing, at least the words. And we've been hearing the quantum revolution is coming. Well, I've been hearing that for a very long time. I was a very young student at the University of Montreal, well, a bit uh, like 20 years ago, was studying uh, quantum computing and quantum cryptography with, uh, under the supervision of uh, Gilles Brassard, who uh, co-created or co-discovered quantum uh, key distribution and quantum teleportation. So it was really hard to be in that lab and do anything other than quantum. It was quantum everything. Then I decided to go and get a job. This was a bit hard to, to be applied cryptography and doing some quantum things at the time. So I went off uh, becoming a quantum or a crypto developer, uh, work at the company Zero Knowledge Systems where we built a predecessor to Tor, uh, did some PKI work. Then I went to a company called Credentica where we built an anonymous credential system for PKI with privacy and uh, technology called, uh, developed the U-proof technology ended up at Microsoft, and then many years later I'm back at this quantum thing. But this time on the other side of, of the fence, not trying to build a quantum computer, but trying to defend against it. And I'll talk about it a bit more. So it's hard to just keep track of what's going on. There's, every week there seems to be a new result, new quantum um, computer being built, bigger, many more qubits. I can't put slides anymore of a news report, just put the search slide and search link and then you'll be able to find the, the, the results of the week. Also down the, the hall, my colleagues uh, at Microsoft Research are building, are trying to build a quantum computer and also and to, they just released this year a, a Visual Studio uh, programming lang language, Q Sharp, in which you can program a quantum computer. So we don't have the chip yet, but when we do, we'll be able to just plug in that software and be able to use it. So they're trying really hard to do it, which means for us, crypto uh, specialists, we have to do some things to defend against it. I'll talk about it later. So first of all, what is a quantum computer? Well, very simply, it's just a machine that operates with the laws of quantum mechanics. You know, the computers we have, they all operate with the classical laws of physics. We understood them, but when we start using uh, smaller particles that follow different laws of physics, there's some really weird things that are happening. So first, the basic of a quantum computer is a qubit, a quantum bit. And unlike its classical counterpart, it's not either zero or one, it can be zero and one at the same time. A bit like that um, famous experiment, thought experiment of the cat that can be dead or alive, Schrodinger's cat. Well, a quantum bit can be zero and one at the same time which is great if you want to build algorithms with that. Because imagine you're trying to solve a problem, trying, let's say trying to find a, a path in a maze. Well, if I can see zero is turned left, one is turned right, then you can put it both zero and one at the same time and then have both paths be taken at the same time. And all have the, the computation paths be followed at the same time. And at the end, one of your parallel paths of computation will have found the exit to the maze. The problem is that when you look at the solution, when you look at your quantum register, at your memory, 
you, this quantum superposition is uh, not visible to, uh, to you <laughs> in the classical world. One state gets picked at random depending on the amplitudes alpha and beta of the quantum bit. And only one result at random gets returned to you. So great parallelism, not great output. So quantum uh, algorithm designers, they have to find ways to use quantum interference, like if you remember your physics class, this uh, double slit experiment, where you can put two holes in a piece of paper, shine some light, and then kind of the wave properties uh, uh, interference makes a little black-white-black-white uh, black, white pattern because the waves interfere at some points, and where there should be lights, there, there's not, because the, the light particles uh, the, the interfere and cancel each other. So we can do the same with quantum algorithms where we can just have some paths being um, destroyed and only the, the computation results that you want get popped up at the end of the computation. So it's very subtle and, and hard uh, art to, to design quantum algorithms. But there's a few that are being around. Another strange property is that qubits can be entangled. Entangled means that uh, imagine you have two coins and uh, you, uh, you take them apart and you flip them. And you're going to get zeros and ones and do double zeros, double ones, zeros and ones, ones and zeros. But if they are quantum coins and you have them interact in a special way and they become entangled, then you can separate them and they can be very far apart and you flip them, they're always either zeros or always either one, or either tails or, or head or tails. You'll never see tail and head and head or tail. That's really weird. That freaked out Einstein. He called that a spooky action at a distance because he imagined that one coin would get a result and would need to send a faster than light signal to the other coin so it matches its response. <clears throat> so it's hard to understand what's going on, but it's just an observable fact that these particles can be entangled and, and to always share a state across space. And that can be used in quantum algorithms as well. And quantum computers can be built with all sorts of things, this, the, the spin of an electron, the orientation of a photon. My colleagues are betting on this uh, topological computer be used with anions that uh, could provide better stability with bigger machines. And Richard Feynman, a, a famous physicist, uh, famously said that nobody understands quantum mechanics. You just get used to it. For us computer scientists, we don't really care. Like, I don't ever care how it's built. It's just a black box, and you give me these mathematical properties, and we can design algorithms to solve new, new problems, new class of problems. So it's all great. Some of my colleagues are very excited about that. Uh, the security folks are a bit more worried, because although quantum computing provides great advances in many fields, in chemistry to find new ways to, to design molecules and, and uh, and, and optimization problems and machine learning, it has terrible consequences for cryptography because there are two algorithms. Ironically, the first two algorithms that I've known in 20 years ago were only used to, to break cryptography almost. The first one, and here is the quantum menace. Oops, two of us. This is Peter Shore, um, designed in 94, his famous algorithm that by um, doing what's called period finding in algorithms that can be used to factor uh, <clears throat> large numbers and find the discrete log of numbers, which are the two problems underpinning RSA and DSA and the elliptic curve variants like ECDH, <coughs> DSA. So using Shore, we can basically break most of the cryptography, all the public key cryptography that we use today on the internet. The other algorithm that's very important is the Grover algorithm. It allows uh, database search and function inversion. It improves it by a square root factor. Essentially, it's kind of described as finding a needle in a haystack. It's able to, to find a unique solution to a function uh, that you're looking for. And it can be used to help the brute force of uh, finding a digest like in hash functions or breaking uh, block ciphers like AES. And it, it has consequences, but they're not terrible because of the square root improvement. What we need to do to uh, secure against this algorithm is just double the key. 
the key size of AES or double the hash size of SHA, 256 to uh, 512. So, okay, sounds bad. So uh, how long do we have? When is this quantum computer going to be built? Well, there's been a lot of studies about that trying to see what's the best estimate of when the Shor algorithm will be built. Uh, Michele Mosca is a professor at Waterloo as a often cited quote that uh, by 2031 there's a half chance, a 50% chance that we'll get a quantum computer. Um, and he revised that in 2017, two year, uh, last year, this one in six chance 10 years ago. So, and, and uh, another uh, researcher, ben, uh, Simon Benjamin from Oxford, if you're willing to go Manhattan Project, meaning you just put all your effort as a big government behind it, then maybe, uh, yeah, six to 12 years. Some of my colleagues also share this 2030 deadline or estimate. And that's a little diagram that shows you the difference between breaking RSA uh, 2048 with uh, a classical or quantum computer. So you need about a uh, number of bits to, to, for the algorithm. And for a classical computer, it would take billions of years. So we're safe. We, we know that. For a quantum computer, depending on its operational uh, speed, so at one gigahertz, for example, you would just get uh, a few seconds. So it's a, a game changer. It breaks it totally. So now, what we need to do, given the, the quantum people would be very optimistic, because say, yeah, we're going to build it soon. We've been trying, we're going to build it soon. So we don't, I don't necessarily believe that we're going to have a fully functional computer in 12 years, but as security uh, specialists, we have to be careful and assume the worst case and be ready to have something else. And we do, we do need something else. We need alternatives, so-called quantum safe algorithms or post-quantum cryptographic algorithms, which are quantum algorithms that are secure against a quantum computer. It doesn't mean that they run on a quantum computer. That doesn't mean that at all. And it's not uh, quantum cryptography, which is another field, or quantum key distribution, which is a, using quantum uh, mechanics to exchange a key. So that, these are all separate subjects. This is normal classical cryptography for which we don't know any classical or quantum algorithms to break them. And that is the big field of post-quantum cryptography, which is getting more and more attention. But first question we can get now is, why would we care about this now? Okay, we'll think about it in 10 years. We, we have time. We're busy. We have all sorts of things to do. We have blockchains to implement and uh, all sorts of things. Well, the main, one of the main reasons, the big reason, is that the secrets you have today are at risk. Not to be encrypt, decrypted now, but they can be captured uh, now, recorded now, and decrypted later. All major countries have the capabilities now to just... Uh, save the internet traffic and decrypt it later at their, at, the, at their leisure when they have a quantum computer. So that's very significant. Another more practical uh, but no less important uh, item is that it takes a long time to update standards and software. So we need to understand today. So if we are to replace these algorithms, what does it mean to plug them in TLS and SSH and to update all our software stack? We know at Microsoft we have a lot of experience you know, from the flame malware and all or, uh, <coughs> stocks next and all attacking um, very old uh, ash functions like MD5, you know, like these MD5 collisions. We know it's been outdated, it's been replaced, but there's some very old software that's still running it in some weird configuration. It takes a long time to get rid of it. So we need to make sure that by the time the quantum computer is here, all the insecure algorithms are gone. And lastly, one thing that's very important or to consider is the ability to, to um, use hybrid modes. So to be able to use classical cryptography with post-quantum cryptography uh, in a safety net, to have best of both worlds, to have the two protections. And that's going to be an interesting scenario for a while. I'll describe that later. So most of the industry now uh, is focused on the NIST competition. NIST is the uh, National Standard, uh, Institute of Standards and Technologies in the U.S. It is the, uh, basically the de facto uh, 
they, they, they define the de facto standards for, for the cryptography used around the planet. Whatever NIST does typically is followed around the world. Um, they've basically made a call to uh, replace the cryptography that we have today with post-quantum version. So they have this competition. It started in November of this uh, last year. And they're basically looking for new signature and encryption mechanisms with five security levels. And they got 64 submissions uh, in their competition. 19 uh, signature schemes and the rest are encryption or key uh, encapsulation mechanisms. So you can see all the details on that, uh, at that link, all the submissions. And uh, some of the work I'll be presenting later is integrating some of these in, in higher level applications. And they think that they're going to have like standards by 2022, 2024, so to let, to give us time to integrate so that we're ready by this 2030 uh, deadline. So what do, the, do these uh, post-quantum algorithms look like? We know we cannot base them on factoring and we cannot base them on discrete log because they're broken by shore. So there are many more families of, of uh, mathematical problems that we can use to build uh, new type of crypto systems. The first one, the most popular one, is the, the lattice-based systems. They're based on mathematical lattices. Um, and there's one of them has been around for a long time, and true, has been around from the mid-90s, always been competing with RSA, but there was no ever a reason to, to, to move away from RSA. So never got much uh, uh, traction, but now it's kind of uh, some people have been looking at it, and also been more uh, newer uh, versions, uh, updated problems with uh, provable security. Uh, for example, the learning with error problem and uh, its ring version, the ring uh, RLWE, and I'll be presenting one scheme uh, that's that has been uh, designed by Pickert. And some of my colleagues have been designing this, this scheme, BCNS, to uh, plug it into TLS. It's been improved, uh, optimized by another team, and became New Hope. And then there's some other uh, subsequent scheme, like Frodo, that comes back without the ring. I'll talk about it in a few seconds. Another family is the code-based systems. They're based on error-correcting codes. They've been around forever. And they've also been proposed as a public key system uh, at the same time as RSA, uh, so they've been around for a long time, but they have uh, some, some uh, disadvantages, they're huge uh, keys, so they were never considered as an alternative to RSA until now. And there's been a lot of um, code-based system proposed, 19 of them out of the 64. Another one is multivariate systems, so they're based on uh, essentially multivariable polynomials and you have to solve the equations. Also developed in the 90s and now uh, nine submissions based on this family. The other one is uh, ash based systems. So these ones also very old. Like a, a lot of these the ideas are, are date back from a long time because researchers, cryptogra like, cryptography researchers have been busy and proposing things but in practice we're very conservative. We, we pick the standard and we are not allowed to uh, to be creative and take new ideas in very often until we're forced to. So uh, this one, signatures based on Lamport signatures and Merkle, a co-inventor of public key uh, cryptography, uh, designed this Merkle uh, signature scheme with a tree of, of Ash Digest. And, uh, uh, and there's been newer proposal, LMS and M M XMSS, extended Merkle signature scheme, I think that means. And these will probably be considered for earlier adoption than, than what the NIST competition, because they're very well understood. We know the impact of quantum computer on hash functions. And we know that Grover is optimal, so we know it's like the worst case scenario. We can go with that and we'll, we'll be safe. And there's some pros and cons with, with the, uh, the hash tree versions, but at least we know that they'll be secure. And finally, there's the other category. There's seven of them. Uh, is one that uh, we've been working on based on isogenies. There's been a talk last year in the village about it on SIDH. Um, and another one uh, from my colleague is uh, based on symmetric ciphers and zero knowledge proofs called Picnic, a signature scheme. 
So there's a wide thing. So NIST and the crypto acad academia will be very busy to analyze all that. You know, you need a specialized PhD in each field to be understand to understand one scheme. You know? so, so it takes a lot of, uh, it's hard to find uh, somebody with the knowledge to look at all of that. So this, it's, it, the whole industry is looking at that in detail. I don't want to go into details about these slides because they're very small. Uh, but it's, these are slides from NIST after uh, the competition uh, deadline. They just showed some, some results uh, of performance that they ran. You see a key size. So you see the different families. So lattices uh, typically perform very well. And some others um, like the uh, code base, for example, have like very large uh, keys, uh, public keys, and, and uh, so might be more difficult to integrate. Same thing with signatures. Um, I'll let you uh, inspect the slides at your leisure to see the details. I'm just going to fast forward through that a little bit. So uh, my colleagues, I've been dealing more with crypto integrations and, and, and programming these things. Some of my colleagues are actual mathematicians building these schemes. And these are the four collaborations we had in the competition. As you can see, it's always multi-organization teams, a lot of collaboration across the industry and academia to, to, to make these. So uh, Frodo is essentially like New Hope, but um, without the ring assumption and the learning with error. So Frodo is you remove the ring, you get it. And uh, so it's team felt it was more secure that the ring learning with error might not be as secure as we know because it's very new. And the uh, just learning with error counterpart is, is safer. It's slower, but it's safer. Psych is an updated SIDH. It uh, allows you to reuse the keys. Uh, so I felt it was a, a better design for the submission. Picnic, as I described it a little bit. And QTesla is a ring learning with error signature scheme. So all the code is all open source of these things, like all the submissions. And you can and take a look and experiment with them. So one thing we did is uh, trying to plug these into real life applications, like in TLS and OpenSSL, see how it works. So after doing that a few times independently, it gets bothersome. So along with a colleague, uh, Douglas Stibula, uh, McMaster, now he's at Waterloo, um, he started this project called Open Quantum Safe. And we joined and, and integrated our, our, our solutions and I, I helped designing the, the signature API in that project. Um, essentially, the goal is to have a framework where you can plug in all these post-quantum algorithms, and then in turn you take the framework, this common API, and integrate it into your applications. So that if you take that and plug it into OpenSSL, and then you have a new scheme, then you can just integrate it in OQS, and then you get the integration into OpenSSL and OpenSSH for free. So it's very, um, it's very useful. It's been useful to us. It allows us to do uh, prototyping really fast. And it's also open, right? So we're open to invitations. So I don't know that the, the, a lot of people in this room, I'm sure some of them might know or have been involved with one of the 64 submissions. You might want to take submissions. If, if the core team didn't have time to take a new algorithm and plug it in, we're trying to do that. But you can accelerate that by submitting a pull request with your own algorithms and integrating it into OQS if you want to see how it performs in TLS, for example. There are two branches. One is the master branch. Uh, which allow us to uh, to have a tighter integration and reusing a, a random number generator in all the constructs of OQS common code, and it's meant for integration into applications and, and with the goal to ship it. Uh, and there's a NIST branch which has a more lightweight approach, is just to take the NIST submissions and e easily integrate them without touching their code base too much, and just to be able to compare them. So, okay, you get the link there, so feel free to, to come use that project or contribute to it. We're, we're welcoming uh, feedback and, um, and new contributions. Okay, so now I'll be talking a bit about the integrations that we've been doing. So the first one we did was in TLS 1.2. We've integrated into OpenSSL 1.0.2. Uh, OpenSSL has two layers. Uh, there's the, the bottom crypto layer, and there's uh, the top SSL layer. 
So for the to-do key exchange, we only had to touch the, um, uh, the SSL layer because when there's the post quantum crypto, we just branch off to OQS rather than using the low level crypto API. But when uh, we integrated the uh, signature API in the PKI, we added to touch the PKI ASN1 infrastructure, which is in the crypto layer. So that was a bit more work, actually a lot more work, but uh, um, the result is that you're able to issue post quantum uh, certificates and use them in TLS to do authentication. So for key exchange, we have two modes. We define new uh, cipher suites, and we also defined hybrid cipher suites in which you essentially do a classical key exchange and a post quantum key exchange, and then you take the results of both and you co candidate them, and that's what you feed into the, uh, as the master, pre master secret that gets fed into the key derivation function of TLS. And that gives you a double the protection. So we might be worried that you're doubling the time, uh, the, fish, the, the work, so uh, it might have uh, bad consequences on performance, but we'll see that's not that bad uh, on the next slide. And we also, uh, as I said, did the post-quantum certificates. And there were some uh, problems there, some of these schemes. For example, Picnic has very large uh, uh, signatures. So uh, the signature size in TLS is 2 to the 16. So uh, everything past the level 1 of Picnic, there's level 1, 3, and 5. But so everything 3 and 5 didn't fit in TLS. So that's why it's useful to do these experiments. Right now, we can see and give feedback to the designers that, OK, it's, uh, this thing's too big, it won't fit. So the crypto designers might want to tweak their things, remove a few bits here and there so it fits into a known algorithms that are targeting. So that's why we were able to, uh, in fact, this work was done before the submission, didn't fit, changed a few things, and what was submitted to NIST made sure that it would fit into TLS. And also tested in Apache 2.4.25 at that time and uh, worked well. So we could deploy that and so can you, you can test it, just download our fork and uh, you'll be able to, uh, to test that. If you don't have time to take notes in there, that's all in the Open Quantum Safe project. Everything is listed there with all the sub projects and forks, so don't worry about that. So this is an interesting uh, diagram that shows our experiments uh, running these algorithms in TLS. So this, these are pre-NIST submissions, so all the algorithms have either been optimized or changed to be more secure. <laughs> so take the performance as a grain of salt here with a grain of salt, but the, uh, what's interesting is to see uh, the trend. So you see the HE, the orange line here is the baseline, that's basically what's being used, uh, favored today by web uh, servers. We see that uh, some of the post-quantum ones, like New Hope is uh, lattice ring learning with error, quite efficient, even more efficient than ECDHE. And the Frodo one is uh, the same one without the ring, without the ring, so just the learning with error option, so slower, but uh, not as bad. These are connections per second, so here it's uh, 900 up to uh, 1600 and ECDHE like 1200 or so. So it's not bad, like things are gonna have to, to give at some point. We can't have the same efficiency as we have today in the world where the quantum computer exists, but things are not catastrophic that we see. We've seen some, if you look at the specs of some of these crypto algorithms is the terrible the key sizes and the running time, but when you plug them in real life, like it with, with the good settings, you see that oh, it's not that bad. And the other interesting thing is that here is we retrieve multiple uh, payloads, like web pages of different sizes, one byte, uh, 1K, 10K, and 100K. So normal websites today, they're quite big. So the cost of the crypto gets amortized, like if the more the bigger the website, uh, the page, then the cost of to do the TLS negotiation gets amortized with the download time of the page. So the more we get to normal size pages, they all kind of merge together and the cost of the post quantum there is not very apparent. Bottom line, this stuff is quite practical and can be considered to be used today in the hybrid mode. And the other thing I haven't mentioned is the hybrid modes. You have here ECDHE and you have here New Hope plus ECDHE, you run, run both in parallel. So very close to ECDHE, so the cost of new. And the same thing with Frodo and Frodo plus ECDHE here. So you, so running the hybrid, which is the, the recommended way to go for, for a while, because you, you want the security of the 
classical system today with the protection the, the, against a future quantum computer you want it now. And it doesn't cost you too much to have it. This is a similar diagram with, um, with uh, signatures. Also, don't care about the numbers too much, but the clustering. We see that we're comparing here uh, Picnic and RSA for the signature, just because that was the only algorithm available in OQS when we did that. That's pre-submission. And um, yeah, so Picnic's more expensive. as a very big certificate, but at the end of the day, uh, when you plug it in the real world TLS, it's, it's really not that bad. Okay, now most interesting, more recent work, the TLS 1.3 integration. So TLS 1.3 was officially released yesterday, and we already got it working, and OQS did that overnight. Yeah, it's, you know, we've been uh, doing on the draft specs and the draft code, and the, this is uh, the, the integration um, we did in OpenSSL 1.1 and beta 4. Um, so it's really nice to work with TLS 1.3. I'm just gonna put all the information right there. Uh, because it's a way nicer protocol, the state machine is cleaner, so it's easier to, to deal with integration points. In particular, the key shares, that's where you put all the crypto information in, with, that you exchange. And it already supports hybrid with, with the, the pre-shared key, PS key, and, and ECDHE. So there's already these mechanisms to negotiate multiple keys, which is nice that we can use. Um, the base spec consider everything curves because they only use elliptic curves. So we have to cheat and call ourselves curves. That's what we do to define new algorithms. But I figure that's going to be fixed at some point and somebody will write extensions. Probably you want to retrofit RSA in there. I'm sure some people will do that. So somebody will define, will agree at some point on post-quantum uh, official ways to integrate. So right now, just to test and prototype, we just call ourselves curves. And uh, we tested that in the Nginx uh, web server, just because Apache didn't support TLS 1.3 on the master branch when I tried that. But this web server did. Also, you can use curl to, to do your tests. And everything works. And the details are also on this uh, open quantum safe wiki page. All right. I wanted to, uh, how am I doing on time? Let's see. Oh, good. Um, I guess I'll finish the presentation first and now I'll get to the demo afterwards. So a little bit about hybrid scenarios. Um, I've been talking about the key exchange hybrid and there are multiple ways to go about it. So the first one, the one that we have implemented is called the naive implementation. You essentially just do the classical key exchange and the post quantum one independently and then you just mix the results, you, you concatenate the results, feed that into the key derivation scheme. Uh, you just need to give a new name to this algorithm as a combo scheme, so you define a new, uh, like a new identifier for that and then you can call it in your library. There are more advanced proposals out there, uh, one by uh, White and one by Shikang and Stabila, they have different pros and cons. One that supports multiple key shares. You could mix uh, classical and, and a lattice scheme and a code base scheme and like a like multivariate scheme all in there to, to edge your bet. That's the roulette here to, to edge your bet. You don't have to pick a number. You can pick a color or a series of numbers so to, uh, to be safer. Um, the other one is more of a dual, just two schemes. And I did not implement that in, in this integration just because uh, OpenSL was not ready. They didn't even support multiple key shares at the time, which is needed by the base spec. So when they do, and we can take that code and upgrade it and do more advanced uh, hybrid schemes. For PKI, it's, uh, we haven't done that yet, but it's a bit f uh, future work. It's also uh, not as urgent because for key exchange, as I said, you can record the traffic now and decrypt it later. So the attack is valid today. For breaking the authentication, it's an active attack. So you need somebody to be able to break your signature or, or, or forge your certificate during the, the lifetime of the certificate. So that's like, let's say the certificate's valid for a year, so if we have quantum computer in 10 years, in nine years, we'll care about that. But we're starting to think about it, so uh, in, in a year or two, we'll probably have uh, a solution for that. 
And the question is how do you convey two signatures in the TLS exchange? So do you have two certificates? Do you have a certificate with two public keys, one in a, an extension? Do you use the TLS extension mechanisms to provide a second public key? Multiple ways to go around it about it and um, this paper is a good overview of all the, the problems that needs to be solved in that case. But as I, as I said it's not as urgent uh, for hybrid deployments today. Another performance measures with TLS 1.3 that was run just on this machine on local host between the client and server just to get ballpark figures so uh, nothing's optimized but uh, just to, to get the ballpark and that's with the schemes that were uh, in OQS some of the schemes. Um, so we see again that the lattice, the ring version of the lattice performed very well, very comparable to uh, uh, ECDHE which is the orange uh, baseline and when you remove uh, the ring assumptions you get something like Frodo and uh, it's a bit uh, not as efficient but more, more trusty, uh, more trustiness in it and something like Entru, like this, something like Psyche, which is really nice because it's, a, it's very comparable to elliptic curves. The closest thing we have to elliptic curves, it can be a drop in replacements uh, in a lot of, of protocols that assume elliptic curve defilement type exchanges. Unfortunately, they, they don't perform as well. And for signatures, we get the expected again Q Tesla wand uh, lattice scheme performs very well, as well as. Uh, uh, ECDSA with uh, P256 and uh, Picnic. It's a simpler assumptions in a way, hash functions, uh, and uh, performs just a bit slower than RSA. Okay, so that was one TLS. So There's been a lot of work in TLS because it's an important protocol. We also did other integrations. One is an SSH. SSH. Uh, uh, as another protocol, I mean, it's you know similar to, to TLS in, in, in spirit. So you can go in and replace the crypto parts with the post quantum ones, and uh, it's another exercise that we did. Um, and the latest uh, software that we have is a fork of OpenSSH 7.7, 7. uses the key exchange algorithms in OQS. So the more we had and uh, refresh that fork, then the more algorithms we'll have in there and it supports uh, post quantum and hybrid modes uh, for the key exchange only, no, no signatures yet. So I don't want to spend too much time on that because a little bit uh, similar ideas but you can check it out in our fork if you want to try. So another uh, interesting integration point that we have is OpenVPN. So unlike other VPN solutions, OpenVPN uses TLS uh, for its uh, security. So which is nice and it uses OpenSSL so we can use our OpenSSL fork to, uh, to protect uh, the VPN exchange. And so we have a fork of OpenVPN that allows you to test the key exchange algorithms and use either RSA or picnic certificate. So what's nice about that is that for a long time uh, in the future there's going to be applications that will never be updated or there's going to take a long time to be updated. So there's going to be a long tail set of applications that uh, will not be uh, quantum safe for a long time. So what you can do is just have your classical software running and just wrap it in a VPN, post quantum VPN tunnel. So then you don't have to touch the applications and you can just secure the channel and you get uh, great uh, protection against quantum computers um, in a centralized manner. So we tested that for example we built a client or Raspberry Pi and Windows clients communicating with Azure VM, uh, Linux VM and uh, to do that. Also have your, did a little experiment where you have your mobile phones connect to an access point and then that thing calls your web services or a post quantum VPN. So don't have to change the phone, don't have to change your applications. It's a very cheap and easy way to achieve that. And uh, that project is available also on our GitHub page and uh, you're welcome to try it. Another integration that we did was in hardware to see if we could uh, actually write these, these post quantum libraries um, in, in secure hardware. So we, we partnered with the Ultimaco, tried it on one of their HSM 
And essentially, we just using their, their, uh, their reference implementation of Picnic and, and compiled it for DHSM, a uh, little bit of, of engineering there, and then got it to work, able to issue uh, Picnic root certificates on the device and be able to issue end users RSA certificates, and everything works as expected. And the details of that can be found in the Picnic uh, NIST submission, so if you're interested. So all, all this goes to, to say that we've, the post quantum cryptography is, uh, it's, it's, it's just crypto algorithms. Okay? There's nothing fancy about it. There's just things that we have not studied for 20 years, so they're, they're new. But other than that, there's just regular algorithms that can be integrated across all the software stack and, and hardware. So at this point, it's a matter of us and community, and if any of you have, of, of software that, that relies on cryptography, you can take these things and starting with the Open Quantum Safe project and try to integrate it and see what breaks. So we wanna we wanna see what breaks and 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 know you as 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 owner of of, of crypto software, you wanna see uh, if you put it these new algorithms, what's gonna break, so you can be agile and be able to change it when it's ready. Not today, but in ten years. When you'll have to change, then you want to be ready. And it's a good thing to try it now. And you can give feedback to these crypto designers. The NIST competition is quite uh, new, so it's recent. So this, these algorithms will be able to update themselves uh, before the final. So if we find out that, oh, just by just changing this, uh, these properties, uh, reduce the, the bit size by one or two, it's going to fit this application, it's good feedback for the designers of these algorithms. And uh, hybrid solutions, important thing to consider. And uh, because it's cheap way, as we've seen with TLS, it's not a big impact, but it could have a great protection for future proofing your, your, your data against quantum computers. And also uh, uh, centralized solutions like having a post-quantum VPN allows you to get a blanket protection without modifying your legacy applications or touching all your applications today. So that's that. I'm going to switch to the TLS demo. I'm going to run it on local host because, you know, DEF CON. So I will not communicate with a real web server, but everything is real code running here. I apologize, it's very small. So um, let's see. I'm going to try to type and hold the mic at the same time. So what the first thing I'm going to do, this is in our open SSL uh, fork. The first thing I'm going to do is uh, generate a certificate. You can't really read, but it's the standard open SSL tune, the request tool to generate a certificate. The only thing that's different is I, I'm requesting a QTesla key. All the rest is standard open SSL. So there it goes. It's very fast as expected. Let me just print out the certificate, no, it's just, okay, it's like, looks like an RSA size key. Like some crypto post crypto algorithms will just scroll a few screens until it ends, but uh, QTesla is a very uh, compact scheme and very efficient, being a lattice one. The key also works pretty well. So now I'm going to just uh, start a server. So it's the S server tool specifying the certificate. QTesla1, that's SRT, and QTesla key, and asking for TLS 1.3. All right, there we go. And now on the other console, I'm just going to have the client. Uh, it's going to ask for Frodo. So it's going to be a Frodo key exchange with uh, the authentication is going to be provided uh, with QTesla. So it's a fully post quantum key exchange and authentication uh, transaction. And it's going to talk to the port here. So there you go. It got the exchange, got the certificate. Um, you're going to have to believe me what's written here because it's not very clear, but signature QTesla1 and the server P2. Oh, I actually asked for the, the hybrid um, P256 here. So you, 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 that's the hybrid scheme. So I did ECDHE with P256 curve and using Frodo. And we get a TLS 1.3 connection. So now let's try to uh, deploy that in an uh, actual web server. So I'm going to copy these certificates. I said copy qtesla.star into my nginx configuration directory. 
It's asking for my password. First try, very nice. So, let me just. Okay, so I'm going to just look at the Nginx configuration. And we can see here I'm specifying the Qtesla certificate as the SSL certificate. And then the last line, SSL protocols, TLS 1.3. So I'm just going to start it. All right. The web server now is running. And I'm just going to repeat my client call. Same thing, so establish the communication. And then we can make sure that the, that the HTTPS connection works. I'm just going to get the default web page, get slash, and I get the HTML welcome page back. All this calling from a TLS 1.3 post quantum client to uh, TLS 1.3 post quantum server. Everything works well, and you can deploy that and have fun today in the hybrid mode. And get protection against the quantum computers that uh, might be built in 10 years or might actually be built in some very dark rooms and very powerful organizations. So that completes the talk. I'll be uh, happy to answer questions if you have any. <laughs>